thanks, uh, Rebecca, so much for coming and presenting uh, Operation Christmas Child. Actually, one of my really, really good friends was adopted from Russia when he was, uh, oh, it's not the screw. I'm just loosening this. It's falling off. Okay, cool. Uh, I have a friend, a really good friend who was adopted from Russia, and uh, him and his sister actually personally received those, and so I know, I guess, directly secondhand how impactful that can be on some, uh, some of those children that receive those boxes. So that's a great opportunity for us to do. Um, also, can we just get a round of applause for the video team? Yeah. That was awesome. I was honestly in suspense. So, all right. Uh, we're going to jump in today uh, to Romans. We're uh, starting off in uh, chapter 6 now. Um, so if you guys go to version, um, if you remember how to do that, you'll notice that the first thing I have there is uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Um, and so... At this point, Paul, in chapter 6, is kind of starting a new section of Romans. And uh, at this point, he's said a lot of things. And Paul introduced the idea in, in Romans chapter 5, in which Sandy um, did a really good job of preaching that. He, indru- he introduced the idea of that where sin abounded, grace abounded that much more. Um, and in Romans 5.20, you'll see it says, uh, now, the law, now the law came in to increase the trespass, But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And Shandy pointed out, rightly so, that uh, Paul's actual uh, word usage there is that grace superabounded. And so the idea is that that Paul is is, is saying here is that grace superabounds over our sins. And so essentially you you cannot out-sin the grace of God, right? And so at this point, um, Paul has said throughout Romans that you you can't, you can't earn your salvation. You can't obtain righteousness through the works of the law, uh, but only by great, or only by faith uh, through grace. And then he says that grace superabounds so much more over our sins. So you like you can't out sin God's grace. And so at this point, Paul is anticipating um, questions because this is this is very new uh, to everybody um, who he's saying this to. And so he opens up chapter six with a question. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? He wonders now if someone might take this truth um, of grace superabounding over our sins to imply that it doesn't matter what we do with our Christian lives, to imply that it doesn't matter if we sin a lot or if we sin a little bit or if we live really righteous lives or not because grace superabounds over our sins either way. And so Paul anticipates this question and he says, Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Um, In the early part of the century, there was a Russian monk named uh, Gregory Rasputin. I think I'm saying it right, kind of like Ratatouille or something, I don't know. Um, But he taught and lived the idea of salvation through repeated acts of sin and then repentance. And so he believed that because those who sin the most require the most forgiveness, a sinner who continues to sin with abandon enjoys more of God's grace, enjoys more of God's grace because he sins more and repents more than the ordinary sinner. And so Rasputin lived in notorious sin. I mean, if you just like look him up, he just he sinned all the time. He just did everything he wanted to do, and then he repented and received grace for those things. And so this is an, ex- an extreme example of the idea behind Paul's question, right? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? But regardless, even though we wouldn't take it to that same level, some questions arise from this grace superabounding, superabounding over our sins. Some questions arise from that, right? In a less extreme way, the question still kind of confronts us. Is the plan of grace safe? Aren't people going to abuse God's grace, right? Aren't people just going to live however they want because they have grace, and, you know, if it's, if it's faith instead of works, won't we just say, well, I believe and then live in any, any way that we please, doing whatever we want. And unfortunately, a lot of modern American Christianity identifies as Christian, but they don't really do anything that God's telling them to do. And that's a little bit, it's kind of that mindset is, is the answer to this question. So this question is very important in how we interpret um, this Coming, uh, the coming actually three chapters that Paul takes to kind of explain this, 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 past, or this question. Um, but we only have 14 verses, so we'll do what we can with that. Um, but many of us, we can think of probably different congregations of churches or different groups of Christians who have probably interpreted this question um, on two extremes. On one extreme, we, we probably know of, of churches or groups of Christians that, that essentially fall back into the legalism of kind of like, 
and they, might, they won't necessarily say salvation through works, but they, they teach and then they live in such a way that, you know, as if, almost as if God's, you know, impending, you know, hand of judgment weren't always ever upon them, then, you know, they, they wouldn't have any, any motivation to live a Christian life. And so they, they, they overemphasize works and underemphasize grace. And then on the opposite hand, you know, we could probably think of churches um, or congregations of Christians or, or stuff like that that, that emphasize uh, God's grace and God's love, and, and, and they do it so much so that, that they forget about God's justice and or justiceness and, and his wrath and the other side of God's nature. And so then it, it kind of breeds you know, a, a mindset of, well, God's grace is so loving, and, and he's so loving, and he sent his son to die for us. And so, you know, whatever we do, we're, we're saved because we're covered by God's grace. And then they go on and live however they want. And so this question here, should we go on to sin so that grace, or should we continue in sin so that grace may abound, is a very important question. And he poses this as an intro for chapters 6, 7, and 8. And we have to remember that Paul has preached um, this gospel of salvation through faith. He's preached this gospel in city after city, town after town, synagogue after synagogue. He's preached it and, and told it to, you know, equals in the Judeo faith of, of, you know, where they kind of believe salvation through works, and he's preached it to, to Greek philosophers. He knows, he, he's done it enough at this point to where he knows kind of the mind of, of the reader here. He knows what they're starting to think at this point, so he kind of, he cuts it off quick. Um, he doesn't waste any time. He poses the question right away. Shouldn't we sin so that grace may abound? Moving on, in verse 2, Paul says, by no means. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, Paul's very short answer to this question is a rhetorical question. Now, a rhetorical question doesn't require a response, right? Um, it's essentially if, if I were to find out that, I don't know, Jacob McFarlane was failing all of his classes, and I went into his room and was like, hey, Jacob, man, how are you going to expect to pass your classes and get your degree if you never attend class? I'm not really looking for an answer, am I? I'm really, like, what I'm saying is, hey, if you want to get your degree and pass your classes, you need to go to class. It's a rhetorical, rhetorical question, right? And so if we were to kind of break down Paul's question just into the statement that he is saying, because he's making a statement, it would sound something like this. You who have died to sin cannot go on living in it. And so his short answer is, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? You who have died to sin cannot go on living in it. In it. And now the verb tense of this phrase, to continue in sin, um, is, the, uh, is the present tense active, active tense. And so it makes it clear that Paul is describing not just like one act of sin or like one mess up or anything like that. He, it, he's describing the practice of sin, habitual sin, living in sin, um, making a practice of sinning. And so just kind of as a side note here, Paul and the other scriptural writers never, never taught that just because you're a Christian or immediately upon conversion that you'd never sin again. Um, and that's you know, not really what our passage is dealing with, but um, no confusion on that. That's not what he's teaching here. But he's saying that you cannot live in sin because you've died to sin. And so Paul moves on in verse 3. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? When Paul says, Do you not know... What Paul is saying is that these are basic biblical truths that Christians should understand. You see, so he's saying, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And so before we believed in Christ and were baptized into his death, his burial and resurrection, we were dead in sin, and we'll see this later, but now we are dead to sin. And when Paul says, do you not know the implication is that he's dealing with basics, fundamental truths of Christianity. Paul did not regard baptism as just an optional extra um, to help you come to emotion, emotionally come to grips with your salvation or anything like that. Um, Paul is simply saying, he's, he's taking it for granted that the Roman Christians have already been baptized. Um, Paul was not writing to his own converts. Um, he was not the first one to go to Rome and, and plant the Roman church. And the same thing is true um, in the Corinthian church. Uh, when he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says, I didn't come to baptize. It's the same kind of meaning here. He's taking for granted that they've already been baptized because he's writing to an existing group of believers. So he's assuming that they've been baptized, and he's just as is consistent with the early church, baptism immediately upon conversion. And he moves on. And so he says, do you not know 
that to continue in sin would be contradictory to what happened when you were baptized. It would be contradictory to what Christ did in you upon your baptism. And so the reason Paul mentions baptism here in this passage is to make that very clear, that it's directly contradictory to what transpired. Moving on into verse 4, it says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So that kind of brings me to my first point for tonight, is that death pays all debts. Death pays all debts, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, But Paul is saying that when we are baptized, four kind of things happen. First, in verse 3, we see that we are united with Christ in his death. Verse 4, into his burial. Verse 5, in his resurrection. And then uh, verse 5 as well, so that when we are raised, we might walk in newness of life. That's the resurrection life, and we'll get into that a little bit more later as well. Um, in verse, verse 6, moving on, it says, uh, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And this is kind of, this is kind of the, the key here, is that death pays all debts. Why did we need to die? Um, why did we need to die to sin? because we were previously enslaved to it. And so what Paul is saying here is that sin should no longer be mechanical for us. It should, we should not continue in sin. We should no longer live in sin. Sin should never be our automatic response anymore. Um, and so because and since death pays all debts, um, everything, everything that we do before um, we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection is for our old master, because it says we are enslaved to sin. Verse 6, end of verse 6, enslaved to sin. But for one who has died has been set free from sin. Death pays all debts. Now, why do I say that? Because as as a slave, if you are, everything that you do is for your master. Everything that you have to do, you wake up in the morning, everything that they tell you to do is what you're supposed to do. And what Paul is saying is is that you no longer have control of your actions because you're acting on the part of another. Obeying your master is an automatic response. But we have died with Christ, and because of this, we have been freed from our old master. When we are united with Christ in his death, we are dying to our old master, which is sin. And so sin is no longer our master, and so sin should no longer be our automatic response. We have the ability now, as believers, to choose righteousness. Whereas before... Our, our first option is to sin. Our mad, automatic option, our, our natural instinct is to sin. But Christ has freed us from our old master in slavery to sin. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 2, he says that all of Israel was baptized into Moses through cloud and sea. And I love that verse because it gives us the picture of baptism sealing the exodus of the believer from slavery in Egypt into freedom. And so what Paul is explaining is that it's stupid to sin more so that grace may increase because it is directly contradictory to what happened in the life of a believer through baptism. We are not slaves to sin anymore. We have already had our exodus, and now we walk in newness of life. We walk in the resurrection life. And so through the power of Christ, we have the ability not to sin anymore. And so by no means should we keep on sinning. To go back to Egypt and slavery in Egypt, metaphorically, is ridiculous, right? Again, reading verse 7, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Death pays all debts. And this freedom, this freedom in Christ is not just eternal freedom. Because normally when we think of, of being united with Christ in, in his death, we think of Christ's sacrifice sparing us from the eternal consequences of sin. But not only are we, are we freed from the eternal consequences of sin through grace, but Christ has also freed us temporally on this earth and given us a freedom from our present slavery to sin as well, giving us thus the ability to choose righteousness. And we'll get in more into that in, in Romans chapter 8 as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and, and, what, and what the Holy Spirit does inside of us. Death pays all debts. I want you guys to think of a convict, a convict commits a bunch of crimes, he or she, really could be anybody, honestly, um, commits a bunch of crimes, 
and is, is on the run. FBI is looking for him. Police are, police are out for him. You know, they got the, the, the headshot everywhere. Everybody's on, on, looking for him. The reason they want to catch somebody who's committed a bunch of crimes is because they committed crimes and, and they now owe a debt to society, right? They want to catch this person and they want to maybe sue them to pay for damages or whatever or, and send them to jail for maybe a very long time depending on the crime. But now I want you to imagine that that convict, while he's on the run, maybe it's a couple years, dies. When that convict dies, he's no longer liable for those crimes. The police aren't going to keep pursuing him to put him in jail. They're not going to try to take him to court and, and put him on trial for his crimes. Death pays all debts. It's kind of a weird concept, but it's an important concept that Paul brings out here, and that death pays all debts. And so when we have died to sin, we have, Christ has paid, through our uniting with him, Christ has paid the price to bring us out not only of, of, of slavery to the consequences of sin, but also slavery to sin while we, for the rest of our lives. So we have the ability to choose righteousness. And this is why we had to die to sin. The application for this, for this section is kind of more of a, an intellectual one. Um, really, we need to, to, to have the understanding of grace to where we don't distort it, one way or the other, right? We have to have a good understanding of what grace is so that we can live in a way as to not distort grace. Um, the idea that we should live in sin is preposterous, of course, and instead we must walk in newness of life, as it says in the end of verse 4. We too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's the both eternal uh, freedom and physical freedom there. Um, but as far as this resurrection life, we can no longer sin mechanically, right? We can no longer, no longer live in sin. We can no longer have sin present in our lives that is something that is daily, something that we continue to do, something that we're not fighting, something that we're not trying to get rid of, something that we're not trying to stop. We can no longer live a lifestyle of sin, we have been set free by the power of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, and we have been united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And to go on sinning is to walk right back into Egypt, into slavery. Into the same slavery that our Lord and Savior bled and died a, hor a horrific death um, to free us from. And so moving into our next uh, section here, verses 8 through 14, um, our next point is that we must live a resurrection life. Now, that kind of sounds corny. It kind of sounds like Christianese talk, and I know I don't really like that either, but we'll explain it. Um, so we must live a resurrection life. Let's go ahead and read, read our section here. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace." And so here, Paul kind of moves from the indicative to the imperative. Uh, sin must not be allowed to reign in our bodies, right? So in other words, we must not obey sin and its passions. Rather, our bodies and our minds must be yielded to God as we realize the resurrection life in our life. And this is made possible because we are no longer under the law, but under grace, verse 14. In verse 8, we see it says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Um, this is that resurrection life. Again, it's both eternal and temporal, freedom and living with Christ. In verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul says that we must consider ourselves dead to sin. As a slave who dies, kind of building off of the, the, the earlier illustration, as a slave who dies who is no longer going to be put to work or, or be under um, its old master, uh, we should also be dead to sin. And so sin should no longer be our master. Sin should no longer be something that, that has power over us. 
We are to consider ourselves dead to our old way of life. And I might have, uh, I might have kind of brought this up before, but, and if I did, I apologize, but it really is something that I think is really cool. I got to see uh, John Piper uh, speak. How many of you guys know John Piper? A couple of you? A couple, yeah, get him out. All right, look him up. He's a really great preacher. Um, I got to see him speak at a conference that I went to, and, uh, and he was talking about how um, for people who have, have grown up like in Christian homes and grown up in the faith their entire lives, sometimes it's hard when, for, for people like that, and probably a good majority of us in the room here are, would fit that category. Um, it's hard for us to kind of see the, that black and white, like the old life and the new life, right? And, and we don't have that super clear defining line of like, you know, I was living in sin here, and then I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and my life hasn't been the same, right? It's hard for us to kind of see that. And for those of you who have, you know, had a conversion later in life, um, that's a lot more real for you. But John Piper explained it this way because he also, he grew up in a Christian home, and he said, he said every time that he sins, it's, it's like God is giving him a picture, just, just a small little just dose of what a horrible man he would have been had Christ not saved him. And that really helped me to kind of get past that black and white kind of old life, new life that it was really hard for me to kind of identify with. And when I think about the times that I sin or the evil thoughts that I think or the things, the urges that I have, uh, the ur- sinful desires that I have, um, is just a glimpse, just a small glimpse of the evil man that I would be if Christ had not saved me. So I thought that might be helpful. But moving on. Paul kind of gets specific here um, in verse 12 when, when, uh, when he says that because of this, do not let sin reign in your bodies. Uh, do not let sin be your master any longer. And so the same, the same is true whether we you know, grew up in a Christian home our entire lives or whether we were converted and have just become Christian within the past couple of years. The same is true. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Old life, new life, living the resurrection life, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will no longer have dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Um, in the following years after the Civil War, um, there was a lot of stories that, that, that kind of came about of... Um, of slaves who were confused about whether they had actually been freed or not. Um, And of course, without, you know, all of the immediate forms of communication that we have now, TV, radio, texting, whatever, um, they didn't have that. And so they may have just heard a rumor, or they may have noticed that some of their friends somewhere else had been freed, but they didn't actually know if they had truly been freed uh, from slavery or not. Um, And there were reports and stories of slave masters who took advantage of this and continued to work them as slaves regardless. But my friends, the reason I bring this up is because that's where I feel like a lot of us are as Christians. We don't know that we've been truly saved from our slavery to sin yet. We still live as if it's inevitable that we're going to sin. We act like sin is inevitable all the time, don't we? We walk around and, and, and we live our lives and we know that, that we have the ability to choose righteousness, but instead we, we have this mindset all the time of, well, you know, I've struggled with lust all my life and so I know that it's inevitable that I'm going to keep struggling with it. Or I know that it's inevitable that I'm probably going to sin again in the future. Or, you know, I've always had a real problem with, with wanting to, you know, to, do- to gossip. I'm like Michael Scott. As soon as I hear something, right, that everybody else doesn't know, I just, I can't hold it in, and everybody knows I'm going to say it anyways, right? And it might be really harmful and hurtful to other people, and it's a sin. But we have this mindset as if it's inevitable that we're going to sin again. My friends, that mindset is very wrong. We have been freed from our temporary enslavement, enslavement on this earth. We have been freed from enslavement to sin. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, be perfect as I am perfect. What did John say in 1 John? He said, my little children, if you do sin, we have a God who is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If you do sin. If. 
And of course, we know that we can repent and that our God is gracious and, and merciful and loving and that he will forgive us. But my friends, we cannot walk around and live our Christian lives as if it's just inevitable that we're going to sin again. There's something very wrong with that mindset. Verse 14, look at it again. It says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. My friends, that is not a command. That is a promise. Sin will have no dominion over you. And that is something that we need to realize. Sin will not defeat those who are under grace, but, those, but, though, but we who are in Christ. Sin will not defeat those who are under grace. And that doesn't mean that we can, can pervert God's grace by continuing to sin. Of course, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, right? We have to remember, again, still, that the same God who brought his people out of slavery in Egypt what did he do pretty, pretty quick after uh, they, they got across the Red Sea? A bunch of them grumbled and disbelieved in God, and God destroyed them. We have to remember the same God that is merciful and loving and gracious still requires us to be responsible to him. Grace gives us the power to rid ourselves of sin, not to continue living in it. God does the saving, but we are still responsible to live as he calls us to live. Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal bodies. We must live the resurrection life. Verse 13, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. That is a promise. And my friends, if we're going to live a resurrection life, that means we have to live as though we are dead to sin. We cannot let sin reign in our lives. We have to live as though we are dead to sin. Sin is no longer our master. And so our application for, for this second part is very practical. We need to identify, every single one of us, we need to identify the areas where we are letting sin in our lives. We need to identify the areas where we have habitual sin in our lives, where we are okay with it. We need to identify the areas where we're so casual about sin that, that we just kind of think, well, it's inevitable that it's going to happen again, and so I'm not really going to try that hard to get it out of my life. And whether that be a TV show that you're watching that, that continues to make you lust or something, that you can't just say it's inevitable and so I, uh, I like it or whatever, get it out of your life. If it's gossip, then, then remove yourself from conversations. Sin must not reign in our mortal bodies. We must live the resurrection life, and living the resurrection life is living to God, living in righteousness. Death pays all debts. We have been set free from our enslavement to sin, and we are now able to live in a resurrection life. My friends, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you always for your word. We thank you for your sacrifice in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that you have not just spared us of the consequences of sin through your grace, but God, that you have freed us from our slavery to sin on this earth. We thank you that you've given us the ability to choose righteousness. And God, I pray that, that tonight that we would go forth and that we would not pervert your grace into something that is not. I pray that we would begin to live as if we were dead to sin and alive to you and begin to rid sin of our lives. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name.